Welcome, everybody. Thanks for joining us this afternoon for uh, October's edition of Learn with Google. And today we're talking about um, guiding students to better results with practice sets. Uh, and so uh, thank you for being here on this busy Thursday. Um, uh, Steve is not here today. Steve is busy doing stuff. Uh, so I, I won't attempt the Maori version of this, but I will acknowledge and respect uh, Naiwi Maori as the Tangata Whanau, uh, Whanau, Whanua, Tangata Fanua of Aotearoa. And we are committed to upholding the partnership of the Treaty of Waitangi. Uh, and I'll put that slide in first because um, I don't know. I think there are a few people who are a little disappointed about the results of last weekend, so I don't want to get political, but um, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of these lands upon which we meet, whose culture and customs have nurtured and continue to nurture this land. And we at least would like to honour the presence of the ancestors who reside in the imagination of this land. So um, again, there's our team for today, and I see a few of us are on here. I can see Harris is here. So Harris, give us a wave. Um, and some of you can see Harris, and there's Jay. Jay is waving. Uh, so that's that's the Google for Education team. Uh, we are a small but mighty team. Actually, we're growing a bit. We're a bit bigger than we used to be, um, and it's all very exciting. But uh, yeah, there is there is faces behind the name. So I make that point. Um, what we're going to cover today is uh, a couple of things. I just want to talk briefly about the Sydney Champions Symposium, just to let people know about it, just in case you'd missed that. Uh, then we will talk about creating and using practice sets. That's the headline act here. We'll, we'll talk about what practice sets are and what they do. Uh, and then, as usual, we'll, we'll dig into some of the um, what's new with Google for Education. Um, Jay and Harris, I didn't know whether you guys were going to be here, so I had planned to do most of the talking, but feel free to jump in at any point. No, don't, um, you know, if you've got something to add, please just jump in and add it. Uh, all right. I just for those who this is relevant for, um, some of you might know that at Google we have some programs for teachers. Uh, the thing called Google Certified Innovator, Google Certified Trainer, Google Certified Coach. Um, one of the things we did recently was we grouped all of those individual communities together into a larger community, which we're calling the Google Certified Champions or the Google for Education Champions. Um, and so if if anyone is a member of that, you're either a trainer or an innovator or a coach, you are automatically now a Google for Education champion. Uh, we've been holding a number of events all around the world for these champions that we're inviting uh, people to. Uh, I was lucky enough, and I think, uh, Jay, you were there too, for Singapore. We were lucky enough to go over to Singapore for the first one. Uh, there's since been one over in Mountain View in California. I think there was one happening in Sao Paulo. Uh, somewhere in um, uh, uh, Ireland, another one happening, uh, they're all over the place. But anyway, we've got one coming up in Sydney on December 6th, 7th and 8th. So if you are an innovator trainer or coach, or you know someone who is, and they have not yet applied, um, we would love to see as many of the community there as possible. That's the address there, goo.gle slash symposiums. All the information is there. I will point out if you are not an innovator trainer or coach and you go to that address, you'll just get a page not found error. So you do actually have to go to that using your innovator trainer or coach account. But hopefully we get to send you one of these things. I'm going to Sydney and um, we'd like to see as many people there as possible. It will be very exciting. We have some really cool stuff planned. I don't want to go into details, but it'll be awesome. All right, um, we're going to talk about practice sets and practice sets are a feature inside Google Classroom. Uh, can I just have a show of hands from the group that is here in the live chat? Uh, who's used practice sets already? Anyone? No? Okay. Oh, okay. Well, it's all new then. So I'm just going to just show a couple of slides just to sort of talk you through the highlight features and then we'll go into a live demo and I'll, I'll, I'll show you how they work. So what practice sets are essentially is, if I use the term smart worksheets, so they're like quizzes or worksheets or um, practice exercises for students that they can do, but they have some intelligent stuff built into the back of them. And the idea is that you can set these tasks, these quizzes, these uh, workshop, uh, sorry, by worksheet type activities for students to consolidate learning. And if a student gets stuck, there are hints and tips and stuff built into the actual exercise itself to get them past any hump that they might be stuck on. What it does is it gives students that efficacy to um, get help when they need it without necessarily putting their hand up and saying, miss, miss, or sir, sir. Like they can actually get their own help on the fly. So that's the idea for them. The way it works is the teachers actually create a practice set. So you can make a practice set on any topic you like. 
I will say at this point, um, they, are, they work really well with some, some subjects better than others. So well, they work really well with maths and science at the moment. Uh, you can use them for anything, but the artificial intelligence may not be as helpful as if you use them for maths and science, okay? Um, so once you create the practice set, you then assign it to the students, the students complete the practice set, and then you get to see the results as a summary page. And there's some smart AI stuff um, that's going on in the background, which we will explain. So a couple of high-level features, uh, they are part of Google Classroom. So you'll see them there in Google Classroom in that side menu when you open up the little uh, panel on the left-hand side. Um, if you've got them available to you, you'll see them there. Now, it is part of the um, Teaching and Learning or Plus edition of Workspace. So if your school is using the Fundamentals edition, you will not see practice sets because it is part of the, the Teaching and Learning or, or Plus edition. So that's the first thing. Uh, second thing, once you go in there and start creating a question, you'll see a screen that looks something like this. Uh, you basically type a question in, you put the answers in, and you, where it says there, search for skills, you see this bit here where it says search for skills? Um, this is where the AI sort of helps out a little bit. So if you were to put an algebra question in, for example, the AI would automatically start looking for resources to help a student get through that algebra question, and it would automatically suggest those resources. It could be a worked example of the problem. It could be a video that they could watch to help them get through it. It could be a text hint, right? But it will suggest things to help the student. Um, you can do different types of questions. You can do short answer, paragraph, single select, or multi-select. Um, paragraph has to be manually graded, so we can't automatically grade a paragraph answer at this stage. So if your question is, you know, what were the seven causes of the Civil War, whatever it is, uh, you would have to mark that yourself, right? But if it's a short answer, multiple choice, or, or um, single select, you can get it to automatically grade that because there's a definite answer. Um, one of the interesting things, you can now also import existing PDF questions. So if you do have worksheets and things that you, you currently have, you currently use, you can bring those in directly so you're not having to reinvent the wheel all the time. And one of the really nice features in here is you can try it as a student. And I know one of the frustrations for some teachers around classroom in general is that what the teacher sees and what the student sees is a little bit different. And there's never been an easy way for teachers to see the student view. Uh, you can at least do that with practice sets. So you can try it out as a student. OK, so um, you can create an existing one from uh, an existing PDF. So uh, how does it cope with formula? Actually, Melissa, really quite well because there is a formula editor in here for creating uh, formulas. So let me show you how that looks. Um, so this little uh, 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 GIF slash GIF that you can see on the screen here um, is an example about how you can take an existing worksheet and then just sort of turn it into uh, a question within here. So you can see there, they go there, they go practice sets, create a new practice set. And when you um, add a question, you can import from a PDF, just like that. You draw a box around the bit you want. Uh, you can draw multiple boxes around multiple bits and you import those questions in. So that's one way of getting sort of complex formulas if they're in a PDF. Um, the other thing that's good to know is um, uh, when you start to put a question in there, like you can see this question here, this math question, it's automatically starting to search for resources based on curriculum. Now, I will just flag that the curriculum this is based on right now is the US Common Core curriculum. It's not the Australian curriculum, unfortunately. So our plan is to build this out across multiple curriculums in multiple um, places around the world. Right now, it's the US curriculum. Fortunately, with things like mathematics and science, there's a lot of overlap anyway. And so we did tend to find that's why it works really well for these. Um, but yeah, as soon as you put in something around fractions, it will detect it's a fraction and it will start suggesting fractions based on that curriculum. Okay, so that's how that works. We'll try and get some examples in a sec. Um, uh, Melissa, this was your question about the math science keyboard. So there's a keyboard built in there. Uh, and so when you click on this little icon here, it will open up a, a, a formula editor. So you can create a, uh, quite complex formulas in there that uses maths and science symbols. Um, so you create the assignment, uh, then once you've, sorry, you create the practice set, then to assign it to students, you go into classroom as normal, you create an assignment as normal, and then you'll see practice sets as one of the options of things you can attach to an assignment. So you go in there, select practice set, attach it, uh, along with whatever other resources you want, you put your due date and 
who it's going to, all the usual things you would do in classroom, and then you push that out to students. So that's how you get it to students. You just push it out as an attachment in classroom. Um, one of the interesting things you get back at classroom is a thing called insights. So it'll give you a panel of results, and you can see down here, um, you've got the list of students that have taken the quiz or the, the, the worksheet, uh, and it'll tell you what they've got wrong and right. Uh, you might notice this one here is kind of a faded out green. So it'll, if it's a green tick, it means they got it right. If it's a faded out green tick, it means they got it right, but they had multiple attempts to get it right. Okay, uh, red means they got it wrong, and if it's just blank, it means they didn't attempt the question. Um, but what's interesting is up here, you've got this insights panel. So it's saying, for example, many students got numbers one and three incorrect. That's a useful thing for me to know. Uh, and also that these three students are struggling with many problems. So the insights panel uses some AI to look at the overall data, and it's looking for outliers in the data to, that might be of interest to you as the teacher. So students who are struggling, questions that were too hard, uh, students that did really well, um, students who had to do multiple attempts before they got it right, it will try and flag those things for you automatically in case it doesn't jump out at you already. Um, uh, so that's that insights panel. You get this holistic view here and you get the uh, the panel down the bottom there that tells you. If you click on a student's name, it will bring up their results in the panel on the right-hand side. And so you can actually dig through and see the each student's attempt at the question, uh, which I think as a teacher is great. All right, so that's, that's that. Let's go into a live demo and I will show you exactly what I mean. So I'm going to Google Classroom. So I've got a little demo here that hopefully will explain everything I've just uh, gone through. So I'm in Google Classroom. This is my practice sets icon on the side here. And you can see when I click on that, it will take me into the practice sets page inside Classroom. And it loads up any practice sets I've got. So you can see I've, I've made a few in here. And I just want to give you a couple of examples. So first of all, uh, let's just look at this simple maths one. This is the, I'll use this as a demonstration because it's just got a couple of easy questions in here and you'll get the idea. So like, what's the perimeter of a square with three meter sides? There's the question. Um, and there's another algebra question and there's like a word question at the bottom, okay? So that's an example of the sorts of questions you can put in. But if we just go back and show you some other things, uh, I used to teach multimedia in a school. Um, so I took, this is the year 12 industrial tech multimedia uh, practice thing from the department of ed, from, sorry, from the, who does it? Whoever sets the exams, forget their name now. Um, Dessa, that's the one. Um, so uh, you can see what I've done here is I've just taken snapshots out of the PDF. And, and you can see I've just, rather than type the questions, I've just created them directly from an existing PDF. So that's one example. Another example here, I found the high school placement test, again, out of it was a PDF. And I just took some of the questions from that practice exam and turned them into PDFs. Sorry, I snapped the PDF in here and then just put the answers in and so on. So whether you create a question from scratch, whether you reuse something that's already existing, uh, you can do both, okay? And I'll try and show you both examples. Everyone okay with that so far? Beautiful. Okay, so I'm going to go back to my simple maths example. I just want to step you through how this might work. So you can see this has a couple of questions in here. I'm just going to pick one of the questions just to go behind the scenes and show you what's behind a question. So I'll click the edit button and it loads up the practice set in edit mode. And so here you can see, here's it, if I unpack that one, you can see there's the whole question. Now, I'll put the question in here. I'll put the acceptable answers in here. Um, when this was first released, you actually had to put the answers in. Uh, we made an update a couple of weeks ago where it will now suggest the answers for you. So, you know, if, if, uh, if you type the question, it will automatically try and use AI to interpret what that question's about and suggest what the correct answer is for you. Uh, so that's helpful. Um, in this case, there are two answers I'd, I'd allow. I'd, the correct answer is 12 metres, but 12 is probably acceptable too. I'd, I'd give correct marks for that. Down here where it says skills, you can see that it's detected based on the question that I wrote, what's the perimeter of a square with three metre sides? It's detected that there's a skill in the curriculum called calculating the perimeter of a square. So it's detected that skill from the curriculum sort of database. And then it suggested this resource down here of a video called how to find the area and perimeter of a square. I did not put this video in here. The AI suggested that video for me. Now, 
if you don't like the video that it suggests, I mean, some of us like to use, you know, our own videos or maybe Mr. Wu or, um, you know, some other resource, you can get rid of it by clicking on the X and get rid of it and going over here and adding your own hint or your own YouTube link if you want. So if you don't like what it suggests, just replace it with something else. Um, this is a clue or a hint, right? Perimeter means outside border. I put that one in, right? So I, I just clicked on hint. I typed in whatever I wanted there and I won't do it there because I've already done it. But you can see, so you can add your own hint. So this was added by me. This was added by the AI. But the hints you can have, and you can have up to three of them, can be a combination of like coming from either place. That makes sense. Okay, so that's what a question looks like. A question, some answers, and then the AI suggesting some resources which we can override or add to. Great, let's get out of editing mode. And I want to show you what it looks like if a student were to do this question. So this is that button I was talking about, the try as a student. So you can see I can do that. And that will then open up a different view. And I don't need that, right? So it's going to load that practice set as though a student were looking at it. So this is what the student sees. What's the perimeter of a square with three meter sides? Now, I want to take you on a little journey here to show you how the AI is trying to be helpful and how the hints that we've put in there are trying to be helpful. So first of all, you'll notice there's a little light bulb on the side there that says show a hint. Wherever you see the light bulb, right, if I click on that question, see this one has hints as well. You can not provide hints if you want. If you'd rather not hint anything to a student, you can do that, but obviously it's more helpful if you do. So. As a student, I'm looking at this going, what's the perimeter of a square? Oh, I don't remember what perimeter means. I don't know where to go with this. All right, so there's a hint. So I click on hint, and the first of my hints comes up. And remember, the first hint in the chain was a, was a hint that I put in there, definition. Okay, so perimeter means outside border. Okay, that's helpful. Maybe now I have enough information to finish the question. But let's say I don't. Let's say I still don't really understand perimeter. So I come in here, and I, I put an answer in here. It's wrong right? The correct answer is 12, but I put six for some reason because I don't know what I'm doing. So I do that and I check my answer and it goes away and does a check and it comes back and it says, well, no, it's not right. Try again. And then it brings up the video. We're solve the area right? and perimeter of a square. So that so video starts to play. Because remember that video was the next hint in our chain of hints. So, okay. So let's say I watch the video and now I think I understand perimeter now. That's pretty good. So I come up here and I realize the answer is actually 12, right? So I could do 12. But I just want to show you what I think is actually the, I think this is a fantastic feature in practice sets. And that's the ability to show your work. That's what we say to kids all the time, show your work, right? Because I don't care if the kid gets the answer right. I want to know how did they get the answer and what were they thinking? What was the process? So what you can do in here is click this button that says show your work. And a box opens up and I can type into that box and I can explain my thinking. Now, in this particular case, it would be better to be able to draw a diagram. So I switch to drawing mode and now I can draw and like show my working about how I'm going to work this problem out. Now, I, I'm going to see if I can do this. If I go in here and I'm going to draw a square. So this Chromebook I've got here is a, a touchscreen device and I'm just simply using one of those you know, those cheap pens with the rubber tips on them, right? But you could have a stylus, right? And I'm going to say, okay, well, this is three. It doesn't like this pen very much. Let's see if my finger's better, right? So three, 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 and three. Therefore, I've got four sides of three. So the answer is 12. And because it's meters, I'm going to say 12 meters. So I'm showing my working, right? That means when I come back up here and I go, my answer, so if I go into that box, Okay, I'll there. That's weird. Oh, there you go. 12 M. And you can see, so I've just written 12 M in the box. I could have typed into it if I wanted to, right? And it's detected my writing. So the handwriting recognition is happening here. And now when I check my answer, it's going to go through, compare my answer to the correct answer. It says, yes, it goes green, gives me a tick. Sometimes it gets a little party popper goes off. Like, really exciting when that happens, right? And that's how it works, right? So I, I I approached the question as a student. I wasn't sure how to do it. I got the hints to help me do it. I haven't had to put my hand up and say, sir, I don't understand, because I can get my own hints because they're built in already, right? 
But again, as a teacher, I love the fact that I can show my work. That's really powerful to me, right? So that's an example of what the student does. Let's just get rid of uh, this and let's just come out of there and go back. Because now I want to show you. So I showed you how to make the question. I showed you what the student sees when they do the question. The last thing I want to show you then is if I go into my class, I go into my classwork page here, and you can see that I've actually done this already. I've sent, sent this out to some students. So I'll come in here. Now I have I have a little dummy classroom in, I shouldn't call them dummy. I have a sample classroom in here, right? Of eight students. And um dream classroom with only eight students, right? But they've all done this. So I've attached this to a assignment, I've sent it out to my class, they've done the activity and submitted it. So now when I come in here and review the work, this is what I get to see. So it's going to give me a summary here on the right hand side of the three questions that were in this little short quiz. And I can see that, you know, you know, eight students got that right, only seven got that right, only five got that right. So that's helpful. But if I come over onto the side here, you can see I get a little summary of which students, I'm just going to full screen here so you can, so you can see what's going on. Um, so you can see there's all the student results. Again, green has got it right, light green has got it right, but multiple attempts, red has got it wrong, blank is, um, didn't attempt. <coughs> and this insights box at the top here has said to me, this student persevered through multiple attempts on many problems, Helen. So if I go down to Helen here, or click on her name there, you can see that, like, I can see she got them all right, but she had to have a few goes to get one and three. So I want to know more about what help, what's going on with Helen. I might need to give her some help. So I click on the student's name and all of her work loads up on the right hand side here. And now I can see that student's work. And I can see in this first question, for example, she actually used some good logic to figure it out. She drew a diagram and she, she figured out the maths behind it. But I can also see she had three attempts at this as well. So when I click on the three attempts, I can go down here and I can see, well, the first time she put in 10, then she put in six, then she put in nine. So like, I need to have a conversation with the student because she was just guessing. She did eventually work it out. So obviously she used the resources. So that's useful information for me as a teacher. Does that make sense? So that's what practice sets are about, is creating these smart worksheets for kids and building in the sort of the the um, the back end smarts to give them help on demand. Uh, and that's kind of the idea behind it. I'll just pause there in case anyone has any questions. I, I was just gonna say that I love the the multiple attempts and how the, the light green is noted now. And that wasn't mm -hmm. a, that's something I haven't really taken a good look at, um, but it does really give you a better insight in being able to go back and look at those steps. So I think that's a fantastic upgrade. Yeah, yeah, no, I agree, Jake. I'm just going to quickly jump into the creation just to show you when you start creating a practice set from scratch. Again, I've gone into the practice sets category here. Uh, and that's where I see them all. I hit the create button and that helps me create a brand new practice set. It comes up with the first question, like, da, 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 there you go. So I give it a name. I'll just call this uh, science. And um, I don't know, what can we do it on? Um, how many uh, electrons in a uh, carbon atom. Let's just do that. Now, you can see that it's actually suggested here the correct answer for me, which is good because I actually didn't know that <laughs> until I started writing the question. I would have had to think back to chemistry classes, right? So six electrons is in fact the answer. But you know, I might I might be kind here and just accept the number six as well. If they just type six, I'd probably accept that as a correct answer. Um, and down here, search for skills. Um, now, if it doesn't suggest something automatically, you can search. So I think the correct term, if I recall correctly, is valence. Let's see if that actually gives me anything. OK, so if I type in the word valence, which is the term for number of electrons in a shell, uh, it actually finds from the curriculum here, finding the number of valence electrons for an element. So if I choose that, it will hopefully, it's, it's suggested a couple of videos here for me. 
So if I go in there and go, okay, so here's a video on valence electrons in the periodic table. Here's another one about finding the inner, outer, and valence electrons of an element. They would be good resources for a student trying to solve this question. In fact, they would probably give them more information than they actually need, right? But that's a resource. And the key thing about this is that I didn't have to go hunting on YouTube to find those. They've all been pre-vetted by teams of teachers who, who have looked at the curriculum and mapped these resources to the curriculum. Now, sadly, it's not the Australian curriculum or the New Zealand curriculum, but it is a lot of overlap, especially with maths and science. Does that make sense? So that's how that works. Uh, and so that, qu that question's done. And then let's say I click on this import button at the bottom here for the next question. It then looks inside my Google Drive, finds, <laughs> finds a whole bunch of PDFs. Apparently I'll be making certificates. Um, <laughs> A lot of certificates. Uh, you can ignore that. Um, okay, so here's here's a HSC exam, for example. Oh, have I got any others? I'm going to use that one. Um, so here's that HSC exam. So it will open up that PDF for me, which I can then scroll down through, find a question that I'm interested in, and say I want that one, and maybe I want that one, right? And then I can import those questions. And then so they then become questions in my practice set. Now, I'm a bit fussy with these things. I actually see how this, this is a multiple choice question. The way it is right now, it's got like all the, all the choices are actually in the question. And so the student would then type in like A, B, C or D. Uh, so I would, because I'm a bit fussy, I would do this. I would click on that, choose the crop button, and I'd actually hide all that stuff and then just put in the answers as multiple choice options. But you can do either, right? You would just, you just change the, the question type right there where it says short answer. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And then you change can it to yeah. uh, single select. Yeah. And so you put in your options there. So it depends how you want to do that, whether you want to just allow a student to type in A, B, C, D, or you actually want to put in a little bit of extra work and actually create the multiple choice options for them. But that's essentially how you do it. All right, finished editing. So, um, yeah, just to try that as a student, if I go in there, yes, I know there's missed answers because I didn't finish it. But if I go in there and you see, again, what this looks like as a student, uh, it comes up with loads the practice set, how many electrons in a, car a carbon atom. Let's say I have no idea. So I click my hint button on the side here and a little video comes up to step me through and show me I'm watch this video tell you how you can calculate valence electrons but okay and if that video is no good and i still get it wrong then it'll play me the second video and so on okay i think that's about all i need to tell you about practice sets hopefully that makes sense to you like i said it is a feature in the plus or teaching and learning edition of workspace uh, and I don't know from the folk that are in the call today what schools you're in. If you're in a uh, New South Wales or Victorian um, uh, public school, government school, uh, you should have access to the Plus Edition because I believe the, those departments have um, invested in that. If you're in a Catholic diocese, uh, most Catholic schools around Australia are also using the Plus Edition. So there's a pretty good chance you are using the Plus Edition if you're in a school. And if you're not, reach out to us and we can try and um, sort that out for you. All right. That is practice sets. Um, let me go back to my slides. I'll just pause in case anyone has any questions. All right. I'll take that as a no. Okay, as usual, we try and go through uh, some of the new cool stuff that's come out in the last month. Uh, Gillian, you have a hand up. Yeah, sorry. I was right. going to type a question, but uh, I was wondering if you can put pictures in. Yeah. Yes, you can. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, well, the pictures, so yeah. at this stage, the pictures need to come from a PDF. Yeah. Oh, so okay. yeah, if you have a picture of something, just convert to a PDF and you can put that picture in. Okay. Thank yeah. You. No worries. So in the last month, uh, in this in these sessions, we try and just go through and highlight anything that's new that's come to Google in the last uh, 30 days or so. 
There is always new stuff. Uh, the list that I go through every month is the short version. There's actually more than this, but I try and pick out the stuff that I think is most interesting, especially to teachers. So let's have a little look. So first of all, there is a new activity view in Google Drive. Um, and I don't know whether you've seen this one or not. I'm just going to come out of Google Drive, uh, sort of out of the slides here and go into my Google Drive and show you exactly what I mean. I hope it's in here. It's not in here yet. Okay. I have multiple Google accounts. It's not in this one yet. So I can't actually show you. But what you'll get is in your Google Drive, up here, instead of uh, like where it says My Drive, and on top of that it says Priority, you'll actually get three buttons instead. It'll say Home, Activity, and Workspaces. And it will actually divide up different views of your drive to try and make it easier to get to stuff. Uh, and so if I just go back to Slides... Come on, go back to slides. <laughs> it's interesting. There you go. Okay. Um, there we go. There we go. So you see in the screenshot here, you've got it says priority, activity, and workspaces. Uh, and the activity one is the interesting one to me. So often, if someone leaves a comment for you in a Google Doc or asks you to do something, like they assign a task to you in a Google Doc comment, um, sometimes it's a bit hard, you lose track of where they actually go to. So now in that activity tab, anything that requires your attention in terms of recent comments or um, approvals or anything that need to happen, uh, you'll find that in the activity tab. So it's all gathered together in one place for you now. I think it's a nice little addition. And that's available to all the editions of Workspace. Um, the other thing that you'll see appearing soon, if you don't have it already, is uh, we've talked in the past about building blocks and some of the, um, the, the, the if you go to the insert menu, some of the things that show up now in terms of dropping pre-built blocks of text in called building blocks. Um, we're trying to make them more obvious. So coming soon, if you haven't got it already, when you open a brand new Google Doc, you'll actually get a little row of buttons appearing temporarily at the top which allow you to drop in an email draft or a meeting notes or something. Or if you click the more button, you can go to all the others. And if you don't want one, then you just ignore them and start typing and they go away. So um, it's just a way of highlighting some of the, the building block stuff that's in there, which is really useful stuff. Um, one of the things that is uh, just coming out right now is um, when you're on a Google Meet call like we are today, if you have a camera that supports 1080, which is like the high resolution, high definition video, uh, you will actually be able to stream your resolution in 1080. Uh, that might not sound like a big deal to you, but I got to say uh, this, this kicked in for my other account a couple of days ago and being able to see people in crystal clear HD makes a really big difference when you're in a call. So um, yeah, if the camera supports it, you'll get full definition, full HD video. Then you see all the wrinkles and things like that. You don't get that soft focus, nice, uh, <laughs> nice look at the lower so resolution camera. It's interesting you say that, Jay. It's interesting you say that because as well as this feature, which gives you high def video, um, there's two other things that have come out as well in me. One is this one, um, and I, I didn't have a picture for this one, but presented content will be captured in higher definition. So for example, I am you're looking at my screen at the moment as I'm sharing my screen here, and it, this is meeting being recorded. So if you were to watch the playback of this meeting, the screen recording of what I'm sharing will now be in 1080 rather than 720. So it'll be a higher resolution version of the screen share, which is really nice if there's a lot of detail on the page. So you won't get any of that fuzzy edges. Okay, so that's that's a nice thing to, to have. But just to come back to what Jay was saying, um, we've also added a feat, feature to Google Meet on the mobile phone. So if you're doing a Meet call on mobile, <laughs> In the settings now, you've got a little button called Portrait Touch-Up, and you can actually smooth your picture. So if you wanted to sort of make yourself look a little like fancier, change your complexion or improve the lighting under your eyes or whatever, like there's a setting in there now that will automatically touch you up. Oh, that sounds terrible, doesn't it? It will automatically make you look better. <laughs> um, and of course, you can turn it off if you don't want it. But um, yes, so funny you should mention that, Jay. We do actually do that now. Make people look their very best. Um, if you've used Gmail for a while, you might notice that there is a template creator in Gmail. 
Uh, so down in the bottom corner, you've always had the ability to create an email and then save it as a template, which you can reuse over and over again. Um, we are introducing that feature now into Google Groups. Now, again, as a teacher, I don't know how much you use Google Groups or not. Probably not, probably not that much. But there might be people in your school who do use it to send sort of group emails to, to people. Uh, you've now got the ability to use templates in groups to send messages out through the groups interface as well as through Gmail. Works exactly the same way. Um, sadly, we made an announcement a couple of days ago that we are deprecating Jamboard. We're actually getting rid of Jamboard, which I think is a very sad thing. And we did fight it to see if we could get uh, change their mind. Um, but unfortunately, you know, Google doesn't just build products for education. We build them for you know everyone. And if a product is not getting significant amounts of use, it just unfortunately falls into that gray area called the Google, Google graveyard. Um, and Jamboard, unfortunately, has fallen into that area. So even though teachers love it, and we use it a lot in education, more broadly beyond education, it really wasn't getting much use at all. Uh, and so the tough decision was made to deprecate Jamboard. Now, it will still be available until late 2024. So you've got another year of using Jamboard. This is giving you a lot of notice here. Um, but what we will be doing is creating integrations with things like FigJam, Miro, and LucidSpark, which, if I'm being honest, are way better whiteboards, right? FigJam is amazing. Miro is incredible. Like LucidSpark is awesome. Like these are all really good whiteboarding tools, way better than Jamboard, if we're being honest about it. Um, and so we're going to be building integrations for these tools. These are all third party tools. They're not Google owned, uh, but you'll be able to use them inside our products as well. So there'll be you know, common logins and it'll work within Meet and all the usual things. So Hopefully that's like a good news, bad news story. Uh, it's It was sad that we announced we're getting rid of Jamboard, but I think the things that will replace it will, if I'm being honest, be a lot better. So just so you know, you've got another year of Jamboard. Um, this is a small feature that lots of teachers have asked for. In the Google Calendar, you have the ability to create schedules where people can book time on your calendar. So you can block out blocks of time and then allow people to book in. Uh, and, you, and what you can do is take a large block of time and divide it into smaller chunks. So for example, you might say, uh, you know, Thursday afternoon, I'm allocating three hours and people can book in to have a meeting with me. Up until recently, the minimum appointment duration was 15 minutes. And a lot of schools kind of went, we want to use this for booking in for like parent teacher nights, but we don't want to have 15 minute slots for parent teacher night. We want five minute slots. Um, and it didn't go less than 15 minutes. So uh, you'll be pleased to know that we, you can now go down to the five minute mark. You can't go lower than five, but five, you can go anywhere five uh, up minute by minute, like six, seven, eight, whatever you want. But um, yeah, that's a nice feature. And that I think brings us to the end. I told you I'd try and make a, a, a quick and quick and easy one this month. Um, so that's, that's the end of this one. Hopefully uh, that gives you a bit of a snapshot into uh, practice sets, uh, what that's about, and just some of those new features. Some of them I think are quite good. Um, we have one more of these this year, uh, and that's on 16th of November, where we'll be talking about showcasing student work with the digital portfolio. Um, I guess we'll be talking a fair bit about Google Sites in that one and how students can use sites to sort of gather together all the stuff they've done for the year and to a single portfolio point. Um, so yeah, hopefully you can join us for that. And um, we plan on running these again next year as well, but no doubt at the end of next month, we will uh, have some sort of a feedback form that we'll send out to everybody and gather your thoughts about what you'd like to see these sessions uh, become in 2024. Uh, we take all of the recordings from all of the sessions we do, and we have a YouTube playlist channel there. The link is there if you're interested. But um, uh, so yes, it's a YouTube playlist and everything we record goes in there. So all in one place. And as usual, if you'd like a certificate and want to add to my massive certificate collection in my Google Drive, um, you can fill that form in there, bit.ly slash GFE certificate, where the G and the E are capitals, uh, and uh, it will automatically generate the certificate for you and send it straight back to you. Uh, it is an honor system, so you were here for, let's call it an hour. 
supposed to be an hour. Call it an hour, right? Um, and that's that. So we have a little bit of time for questions. I might just stop the recording, but um, if anyone has any questions, uh, we will keep going for another few minutes if you would like to. Let me just stop this and thank you for being here.